That was big. <laughs> Through meditation, I program my heart to beat break beats and hum bass lines on exhalation. Right, let's do it. The other day, my kid wanted to check out the games in my PSN library. I was surprised to find Iconoclasts in there. I had forgotten I owned it. And equally content when my kid asked me to download it. They got bored with it and they moved on quickly. But I started playing instead and I, I fell in deep. It's the first time I played it. I fell in deep. The game reminds me a lot of Super Metroid, both in style and quality. And I don't say that lightly. Super Metroid is one of my favorite games of all time. Iconoclasts is a Metroidvania-esque combat platformer with a focus on exploration. You play as Robin, mostly, who is an unlicensed mechanic being hunted down by one concern, a religious-slash-government agency committed to, quote, protecting ivory, ivory being energy-producing substance found in all living things. After only a few hours in, I thought it only fitting to do this session on iconoclasts. But honestly, I couldn't find anything to talk about. The game is familiar, uh, it's technically sound, and it's well designed. As I reached for my final straw, I thought, could I break this game? By break the game, what is this? By break the game, I don't mean find glitches. That's a different thing. And I also don't mean to actually break it, just to be clear. I don't have access to the code. I couldn't do that even if I wanted to. My intent is a thought exercise, wherein I figure out the weak points of this game, specifically of its design, and consider how I might manipulate those to make the game worse. Shouldn't be hard, right? EA does this sort of thing all the time. I think it makes sense to lay out some ground rules. First, the game has to remain playable. An unplayable game isn't a bad game. It's just bad software. The art is off limits. Yeah, I can make the art really horrible, but again, that doesn't make the game bad, really. That just makes it ugly. Number three, I have to explain what I'm going to do conceptually. I don't have the code, so I can't specifically point out a thing and say, I will change this line of code. But I should be able to give a general idea of what it would be that I can do. Like, change the wrench, purple. Number four, always believe in yourself. Uh, to start with, let's talk about the open world. The open world part of a Metroidvania is key. It recalls both the open worlds of the Metroid part and the Vania part of the genre. Iconoclasts functions as a linear experience, using an open world. It's a little weird, but I think it works for the way it's used. Players are given a lot of opportunity to explore in a smaller area, but when it comes to the story, things sort of get locked down more so that you have a more linear experience as opposed to a branching one. I think making the world completely open by removing any barriers throughout the game, you would destroy the narrative. On the flip side, making the game entirely linear it probably breaks things even more. Backtracking is sort of essential, but that becomes really boring if everything is linear. You're just going back through the exact same spot you already did. You don't actually have to think about it. Exploring the map, it's lost entirely. You also lose any reason to block anything off. If the game is linear, why would you, or how could you, go back to an area that had those rails, for example, that you couldn't access previously? There's the stun gun. The stun gun allows the player a few abilities. First, there's the stock functionality, which is just shooting a laser bullet. And later in the game, you obtain the ability to shoot those rolly style bombs. The stun gun also has charge functionality for both weapons which makes each bullet hit even harder and, if aimed at certain types of walls, opens up new passageways. I also learned that you can use this to boost your jumps a little bit, which gives it a sort of ninja hacking ability, which is pretty cool. So if you take away the charge functionality, you make it harder to fight stronger enemies, obviously. Big whoop. The harder takeaway, though, is that the level designer would have to find new ways to block natural passageways, or find some other way for them to be cleared. The wrench is available to take the place of the charge shot's ability to clear passageways. But the feel is different. When you open doors with a wrench, it's very mechanical, while destroying a wall with a gunshot is more brutal. So I just mentioned it, but the wrench, we could break that. 
The wrench does a lot. I didn't even realize how much it did. The wrench basically fills every other need that you might have as a designer putting together a platformer. Here's a list, and I know that I'm gonna forget some things. This is enough, this is a big enough list. It opens doors, it attacks enemies at close range, serving as a melee weapon. It deflects certain projectiles. It allows passage along the rails. It blasts Robin through stone walls if it's charged before using a rail. Charges that one machine in Mina's town. You can catch mid-air bolts so you can swing off of them. It does a lot. So to remove the wrench entirely makes the game unplayable. We can't do that. But if you replaced some or all of this functionality with, I don't know, different tools, it makes the game Kludgier. For example, swinging off a bolt. You jump at it, you hit R2, and you can swing to the nearby ledge. But imagine instead that you had to switch to a completely different tool. The flow would be lost. So let's imagine that R2 is a tool functionality button instead of a wrench button. First you have to open the menu, you have to find the tool that you need, and then you have to go through the process we just described. After which you probably don't need that tool anymore. So you'd either have to A, deselect it in the game menu again, or B, leave it as is and possibly forget that you have it equipped, hit the R2 button and use the electron whip instead of the wrench. Iconoclasts has a pretty light party system. Elro and Mina are the only characters who join or leave your party. Their primary purpose is to provide a sounding board, as it were, for Robin, although they do sometimes help Robin directly through gameplay, and even sometimes they're playable. If you remove Elro and Mina altogether, the narrative is a little more difficult to convey, since Robin is essentially mute. More difficult, but not impossible. If Elro and or Mina don't accompany Robin, then you have fewer options for rethinking puzzles, like the attack on Mina City. It also means that you lose quest opportunities. For example, when you have to rescue Elro and Mina from prison. There's crafting tweaks. I want to give a shout out for tweaks. This is a really unique design for implementing damage mechanics. Like you can't disable the stun gun or the wrench if it falls into disrepair, but you can make it less powerful. It's like a more complicated, uniquely customizable version of the power sword projectile from Legend of Zelda. I think the thing that would make the game worse would be to make crafting tweaks more complicated. As designed, the tweak benches function more or less like a shop. The main difference being that the currency consists of multiple resource types instead of some fictionalized coin. Those resource types, by the way, aren't mined or hunted for. They're discovered by chance in treasure chests. What that means is that you can't farm, say, Improvium, so that you can get your preferred tweak earlier. If you don't have to seek out materials deliberately because you can't, that means you can focus more of your mental bandwidth on playing the parts of the game you're supposed to play. Let's imagine that instead, tweaks are created using harvested materials from the game world, like in Minecraft or Terraria. Now the player has more things that they have to spend time searching for, those things being common materials in safe places so that they can harvest them, rare materials, materials they need for specific tweaks that they want. This all robs focus from the game that Konjak wants you to play, the combat, the puzzle solving, all of that stuff. On the developer side, that means that the tweak crafting experience is less controllable. You'd need to gate tweaks in other ways to keep the players from using them too early. The Iron Heart, for example, is useful for early stage play. However, you might ignore that if you have more materials and move instead to crafting stun gun buffs. And that's fine, except that it's not the experience that Konjak intends for you to have while playing. Consider the game broken. It's not. Considering how long it took for this game to come out, eight years by the way, it may come as no surprise that the experience of Iconoclasts is very thoughtfully designed. The game breaks that I've just explained I would suspect were avoided deliberately. Some of the design choices are done as a response to tropey game design, but ultimately this system works beautifully as it is, and that makes it difficult to find fault with the game. By breaking Iconoclasts apart like this, we can see what Konjak might have been thinking when he was designing the various systems of the game. It also gives us a chance to recognize that the way it's done in Iconoclasts 
is not the best way to design a game. It's just the way that works best for iconoclasts specifically. Like it makes perfect sense to have a harvesting system in Minecraft because you only spend about 10 to 25 percent of the game actually focused on fighting monsters. And of course it gives a designer like myself some ideas about how I might do things. So there you go. Game's broken. You're welcome. If you'd like to release a terrible version of Iconoclasts using these ideas, I request at least 20% royalty. Royal, 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 royal. That's a stupid joke. Whatever.